Today we are starting the panel one, safe, coordinated, and inclusive human mobility is key to recovery from the COVID-19. We are here today with us, the uh, four pan three panelists, one with us, thank you very much for being here, and the other virtual. Uh, allow me to, to introduce uh, the, uh, the panelists today. We have for this panel Deng Don Deng, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation from South Sudan. Thank you for being here today. Stefano Salino, Deputy Secretary General for Economic and Global Issues and at the European External Action Service of the European Union from uh, virtual. Uh, Claudia Pereira, Secretary of State for Integration and Migration from Portugal, also virtually. Ahmed Salahin, Secretary of Ministry of Expatriate Welfare and Overseas Employment from Bangladesh, also from the uh, virtual. Uh, Dear Excellency uh, Malek Dandong, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, I have the honor to welcome you here today. I invite you to take the floor, please. Thank you very much. Excellency Attorney of Treno, Director General of the International Organization for Migration, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you on my own behalf and on behalf of my government and the people of the Republic of South Sudan. It is an honor to be one of the panelists on this important topic, safe, coordinated and inclusive human mobility is a key to recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and to exchange views on the implications for and the future of migrants and human mobility during and in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. At this year's session of international dialogue on migration convince discussions on the implications of COVID-19 pandemic on migrants migrations and human mobility, as well as migrant contribution towards recovery efforts from the COVID-19, we look at disruptive patterns brought upon migration as a whole by the pandemic. Traditionally, people migrate around the world as a result of conflict, natural disasters, or environmental challenges, disruptions such as floods, droughts, and wildfires destroy homes and properties and contribute to the displacement of people. These challenges contribute to some of the human decision to move away in search of better living conditions around the globe. In addition, the onset and continuous spread of the COVID-19 around the world double up stress on migrants. Currently, migrants worldwide are more vulnerable than others because of personal, social, and situational factors brought upon by COVID-19 pandemic. People displaced internally and across borders are particularly also a risk due to regulatory changes introduced as part of global, global response to contain the pandemic. In effort to control the spread of COVID-19 and flatten the curve of infection, governments around the world, including my government of South Sudan, have introduced stringent measures that include travel restriction. Labor migration has been temporarily suspended in some countries, while in others, migration processing and assistance to asylum seekers are being present. These restrictions are already impacting the mobility, migration, and economies. With current global infections and death toll standing at alarming figures, the impact of the COVID-19 over economies and migration is likely to be catastrophic in foreseeable future. South Sudan has seen large population movements 
between South Sudan, Northern Kenya, Northern Uganda, Northeastern Democratic Republic of Congo, Southwestern Ethiopia, Eastern Central African Republic, and Northern borders with Sudan. In light of this movement, the government of the Republic of South Sudan responding by formulating a migration policy to improve and to establish a system of policies and institutions to manage migration in the country. This policy organized action through main four objectives. First, to develop a comprehensive framework for a border management and the governance of free movement. Second, to promote regular labor migration for the socioeconomic development of the Republic of South Sudan and its people. And third, to manage forced migration and provide adequate support to the victim of forced migration. And fourth, to promote migration and development in South Sudan by mobilizing the South Sudanese diaspora for country socioeconomic development and welfare of South Sudanese, a broad reaping development benefit of remittance, facilitating reintegration of returning labor migrants. The policy takes stock of decades of protracted conflict together with the emerging challenges brought about by mobility and migration in the region. Combining humanitarian with long-term migration agendas, despite ongoing progress in building national and state economics, legislative and judicial structures, the institution in charge of migration management remain critical need of action to improve the capacity of the state in dealing with migration-related challenges. As of latest, the government of the Republic of South Sudan and the IOM have launched the National Awareness Program to sensitize citizens on human trafficking. The launch which took place last week aims at raising awareness on trafficking in person among all stakeholders, especially the policymakers, legal practitioners, traditional and faith-based leaders and the general public. As of now, my country has recorded over 2,600 cases and about 49 fatalities. We believe that as part of the community of nations, we still face the risk of recurrent surge of infection if enabling measures are not implemented. Allow me at this juncture to seize this opportunity and to thank the United Nations, WHO, and the friendly and sisterly countries which have been assisting South Sudan in efforts of combating COVID-19, and therefore an appeal to them to continue doing the same support. This gave us challenges facing by migrants. As we all know, migrants are current facing enormous challenges, including but not limited to the following. First, health crisis. As they become more exposed to the virus, often in crowd conditions, in makeshift camps where social distancing is an impossible. Secondly, the socioeconomic crisis, especially those working in the informal economy without access to protection. And thirdly, protection crisis. Since most of the countries have border restriction to contain the spread of the virus. And fourthly, stigmatization of the migrant through fake news misinformation, and politicization of the issues of migration. This stigmatization carries the risk of higher infection when migrants for innocent hide potential symptoms. In a state of seeking treatment, it can also entail longer-term consequences for migrant integration and social cohesion. And therefore, contribution of the migrant in response to COVID-19 pandemic. The contribution of the migrant doctors and nurses during the pandemic have been critical and important component of the frontline workers in some countries around the globe. A state with sufficient number of skilled and motivated health workers perform well as seen in some countries during this 
pandemic and inclusion of the diaspora medical professional has been relieving in dealing with aftermath of the coronavirus pandemic. Remittance from migrants to their relatives in their home countries support families which would have been in a dire economic situation. And way forward, recognition of foreign qualifications and credential to bridge the shortage of health workers by including migrants in health system without discrimination. Ensure that migrant health workers have equal opportunity condition with other health workers and acknowledge their contribution to the functioning of the national health system while fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. And to identify the opportunities associated with the globalization of medical education that aligns the number of intensive and specialty training places to allow international students to complete their training. Excellencies, panelists, I submit the presentation and I thank you all for your listening. Thank you, Excellency, for uh, this uh, excellent presentation of the, uh, the government um, action towards the fight uh, of the COVID in uh, South Sudan and particularly for raising the challenges that um, South Sudan and uh, as all, uh, many of the other countries are facing with regard to the health, socioeconomic protection crisis that uh, the migration has, has provided, and particularly of underlining the stigmatization of migrants in this, um, this uh, period. To our colleague from uh, EU. So I will uh, give the floor now to Mr. Mrs. Um, Claudia Pereira. She is uh, the Secretary of State of the Integration and Migration from Portugal. I have the great pleasure to have uh, here with us Mr. Pereira, who is the Secretary of State for Integration and Migration for, uh, from Portugal. She is a member of the Sociology Research and Study Center and was Executive Coordinator of the Immigration Observatory from 2017 to 2019. The Immigration Observatory has been responsible for the statistical report on Portuguese immigration uh, produced annually for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Roja Pereira is a member of a network of excellence of migration researchers, conducted research on several migration-related aspects, including the financial crisis and qualified Portuguese immigration to London, and published the book Broken Lives, Portuguese nurses abroad. She holds vast ex expertise in labor migration and capacity building on migration for government and partners. Mrs. Pereira, I have the pleasure to, to have you here with us today online. We look forward to your views on this important topic and over to you. Yes. Sorry for, uh, for the interruption and coming back to you. But just continuing, I was just, uh, um, um, I would like to mention, and I think it's very important to, 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 to spread the contribution of the immigrant uh, economically. And so to, to say the example of Portugal, last year the immigrant contributed to the social security system with 651 million euros. So between what the immigrants contributed and what they received from the social security system, uh, the social security system benefited 651 million euros. And I'm, I'm sure that in nearly all countries the same happens. Uh, so this is very important uh, when we are thinking about COVID and any response uh, from, rec from, the, the, um, from the COVID and not leaving uh, no one behind uh, to remember the, the role of everyone and also the role economically. I will present uh, uh, two uh, main issues, the global compact for migration and what we are doing in Portugal and uh, uh, the response uh, uh, and our COVID measures. So regarding the role of the global compact of migration, uh, Port the Portuguese government has been from the beginning in the process that led to the approval of the global compact for migration. 
and uh, it is in line with the sustainable development goal that we all know 10.7 uh, well responsible and well managed migration policies and what we have done is that since november 2019 we started every month to meet the state secretaries and the public institutes to discuss and to make the account of the 1970 measures regarding immigrants in Portugal. From the first meetings, and because we met every, one, well, every month, we understood that the basic resources to integrate the migrants are mainly due to documentation and language. So regarding documentation, um, after the third meeting, we realized that some immigrants could not have the residence permit because they did not have the social security number, and they could not have the social security number because they did not have the residence permit. So the government just uh, issued a decree in which the immigrant could have the social security number if they had a labor contract in the same day. So just in one month, we had 70,000 immigrants who had the social security number. Many of them, they wanted to have this number, but they could not have it because they do not have the residence permit number. So this was an, a change in the law that had a significant contribution to the immigrants. And then that after two months, two months later in March, because of that, many immigrants, so this is one of the measures that we had in the Global Compact of Migration to uh, better the legislation we had for immigrants for them to be regularized. Secondly, regarding the language for them to be integrated, we made an analysis and an evaluation and we realized that the Portuguese language courses had to be changed and adapted to uh, the new immigrants. So we just made the uh, structural changes in the Portuguese language courses so that now the new immigrants with new languages that were not so previously in Portugal as Arabic uh, um, and uh, refugees from Syria or Nepalese or Bengalis um, to better adapt for them the Portuguese language courses. So because of these monthly meetings and the several uh, working groups Regarding the different measures of the Global Compact of Migration, Portugal uh, is a champion country of the Global Compact of Migration, for instance, as Bangladesh uh, also is. And what was the role of the Global Compact of Migration in the response and recovery of COVID? It was very important because all the state secretaries or nearly all the state secretaries and public institutes were meeting every month. Uh, when COVID in March appeared, we just met and we made, we uh, took four measures very important for the recovery of uh, COVID. And as the, the Director General said, that no one uh, is safe until everyone is safe. So we wanted the migrants to have exactly the same social rights uh, as the Portuguese. So we took four measures. First, documentation and regularization. Second, regarding social protection. Third, health. And four, we access to information so that everyone had access to this information. Regarding documentation, uh, we published a decree in March in which all immigrants and asylum seekers in Portugal waiting for their residence permit uh, on the immigration border service we published a decree in which they had their situation regarded as regular. So uh, during COVID, they have their situation regularized. And like this, they have the sa same social support as the Portuguese. They, we avoid like this that they will lose their rights to housing if they do not have money or food access or layoff access or unemployment um, benefits. With this decree, we assured that all immigrants waiting for their residence permit to have exactly the same social rights as the Portuguese. And this was very, very important um, because like this, we could mitigate the COVID. They are also free of charges in the treatment of COVID. And um, we assured that uh, we try to assure that everyone is safe. 
uh, regarding documentation, we also uh, publish another decree in which any document expired during just to, to finish, um, this decree was very important. We also assured the validity of all the documents that were expired until 31st of March. Secondly, regarding the social protections, uh, the children had to add classes from internet, but we knew that many immigrant children did not have computers or internet or mobiles to watch and to, to watch the school classes from home. So through a program of the High Commissioner of Migration, the Choices Program, we assured that the children who did not have computer at home, the, this program uh, took and picked up the school homeworks to these children every week. And so like this, we targeted 4,000 children every week. Also, with that decree that we assured that the same social rights. Now I will give the floor again, and sorry for that, to Mr. <laughs> Sanino. Uh, the Deputy Secretary General uh, of the, the European Union. You have the floor. I hope that... Um, I would like to, um, uh, to start, first of all, thanking um, the IEM for um, inviting us to, uh, um, to this international dialogue. Uh, migration is a global phenomenon, and uh, uh, it does require global solutions and global responsibility sharing. So it is important that we have a... Um, um, common understanding of the challenges that, uh, um, that, that we face and how to uh, uh, move ahead together. Um, because all countries uh, um, around the world are impacted by, the, uh, uh, by migration and only managing effectively uh, uh, phenomenon uh, uh, can allow us to, uh, uh, to move ahead in a concerted uh, uh, manner. Um, we welcome also very much the focus of this year's international dialogue on migration, on the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The pandemic and all the uh, uh, movement restrictions to mobility have had an important impact on migration and on uh, uh, migrants themselves. Uh, just sufficient to see uh, the uh, last um, IOM um, return task force report and on the problems that are facing uh, uh, so many millions of uh, migrants stranded worldwide. Um, uh, movement restrictions uh, uh, are really uh, having a very strong impact on, on migrants, and they are, uh, some of them, forcing it, uh, to leave the country in which they uh, are living at present. Um, it is in this context that the uh, European Union has adopted uh, a few uh, um, weeks ago a new pact on migration and asylum uh, um, for de defining a new framework within which we could uh, um, work together with our partners in, uh, um, to, to manage this phenomenon. Uh, the pact continues uh, um, um, to place the concept of partnership and insist very much on, on uh, this world at the heart of our external migration policy. And uh, we are proposing to uh, our partners comprehensive, balanced and uh, uh, tailor-made uh, uh, agreements. Uh, Strength and cooperation uh, uh, is a key to ensure that migration takes place through safe and regular channels. And this includes working with partner countries, regions, and organizations, uh, as well as at multilateral level. Um, for partnership and uh, uh, migration to be successful, we need uh, uh, joint ownership and joint buy-in by all parties. Our approach is based on the, uh, uh, the idea that there is a, sh a shared interest in managing the flows and that uh, um, uh, at the end of the day, the uh, management of migration flows uh, is in the interest of, uh, uh, of both sides. <clears throat> we also recognize the uh, sensitivity of the, uh, uh, this issue, both for the uh, European country as well as for the, uh, our partner countries. Uh, working together uh, is the best way to uh, save lives, to uh, protect human rights, 
and uh, it can also help our common efforts to fight uh, uh, criminal networks be behind migrant smuggling and to help promote border management through capacity building. Um, we want to develop further legal pathways to the European Union through a visa facilitation, short-term mobility, legal and circular migration, and at the same time was also to improve uh, return, readmission and sustainable reintegration. I insist on the point of the legal pathways um, that already exist. Uh, in fact, as a matter of fact, there are um, about 2 million uh, migrants uh, who enter the European Union legally every year. Expanding pathways for regular migration, including labor migration, on the top of the mobility uh, of entrepreneurs, students, and researchers, is an important element of our comprehensive approach. And it offers uh, significant benefits for countries of origin and destination uh, alike. Um, the new uh, pact recognizes also that the uh, pandemic is causing important disruption, not only in the European Union, but also for our partners. And it, it underlines the need to take this into account in our cooperation with partners. Um, in mitigating, mitigating the impact of the pandemic on uh, migration and on migrants has been uh, uh, very important part of the EU external response to the pandemic. Um, you are aware that the European Union, uh, member states, European institutions, uh, uh, Euro European financial institutions have joined forces under the, this Team Europe approach to address the uh, humanitarian, health and immediate socioeconomic consequences of the crisis. We have pursued at the same time three priorities, the emergency response to the immediate health crisis and the resulting humanitarian needs, um, uh, strengthening of health, water and sanitation systems, as well as partners' research capacity to deal with the pandemic and their preparedness. And finally, addressing the immediate social and economic consequences of COVID-19. Uh, to uh, um, uh, pursue these priorities, we have redirected uh, a total of 36 billion euro to support our partners worldwide in facing the emergency. Um, such short-term humanitarian emergency response um, is essential to face the crisis, but we are also working on the medium and longer-term uh, support to address the structural uh, impacts of the pandemic in partner countries. Um, this is why we will continue working with our um, financial support in the period of, um, from 2021 to 2027, which is the, the seven years of uh, the um, uh, framework EU budget. And um, um, in, the, in this context, uh, um, the new instrument with which we will be working will improve our ability to address migration-related challenges. Uh, the Commission has uh, proposed uh, um, an unprecedented spending target of 10% of the overall financial envelope, which is uh, say, uh, translated in, uh, in, uh, in uh, translates in uh, almost 9 billion euro to address the root causes of irregular migration and forced displacement and to support the uh, migration management and governance. Um, all decision of migration uh, um, can be addressed under uh, this, uh, this package, um, and this would will enable us to have a more coherent and structural approach in the way we support countries of uh, origin and of transit. Um, once again, I. I I want to stress the, the, uh, that the uh, migration issues will remain very high on the agenda of the uh, European Union. And I want to stress once again in concluding that the, uh, uh, the, uh, for us, the focus will be really very much on the managing of the, uh, of the flows 
in a cooperative spirit with our partners as a guiding principle for our policy in the future years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanino, for outlining the EU uh, policy on migration and the new framework that have been developed uh, with the, the adoption of the new Pact on Migration and Asylum. And um, I acknowledge that the, um, the Pact is um, having the concept of partnership, the uh, strengthening of cooperation with, uh, for, um, for uh, the safe and uh, orderly migration as well as uh, outlining the importance of multilateralism in, uh, in reaching out common uh, endeavor. So we outline as well the, uh, the joint ownership uh, uh, that is needed and uh, for well-governed migration policy. Uh, here we have also um, noted the, the three dimensions that you outline in terms of emergency response, the strengthening of health, and sanitation system as well embracing the socioeconomic dimension of the, the, the pandemics. So thank you very much for this, um, this uh, comprehensive and very clear outline of the EU policy. Um, I have um, uh, five requests for the floor. Uh, first, Brazil, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. First of all, let me congratulate you and the IOM for convening this year's International Dialogue on Migration, notwithstanding all the challenges the world faces due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Brazil implemented restrictive measures on the entry of foreigners to curb the dissemination of the new coronavirus. These measures have contributed not to overburden the health service of the cities located in the border. The recent reopening of the air border, on the other hand, was possible because the Brazilian government is strengthening sanitary actions and applied health protocols at airports. Even with these restrictions in force, the Brazilian government guarantee the continuity of cargo transportation as well as associated jobs, storage, delivery, and logistics of cargo in general, the supply of imported goods, family reunion, tourists by air, the implementation of cross-border humanitarian action, and the movement of border residents, provided that the neighboring countries guarantees reciprocity in the treatment of Brazilian citizens. All the governmental agencies have cooperated to achieve a balance between restrictive measures and humanitarian needs. Lastly, due to the pandemic, Operação Acolhida had to be temporarily suspended, but it is not demobilized. Thank you. Thank you. The representative of Niger. Niger. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I want to congratulate the IOM for organizing uh, this uh, dialogue event. Uh, bearing in mind uh, the restrictions imposed on us by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and I want to thank the presenters for the quality of their presentations. As you know full well, the global pandemic uh, has seriously affected our system, especially the health, economic, and the political systems. Uh, the impact uh, of the crisis is being felt, uh, especially amongst the most vulnerable among us, especially migrants and refugees uh, that often are excluded and marginalized. Uh, they need to face discrimination and xenophobia. In the face of this, my delegation considers that the integration of migrants without any distinction, regardless of the COVID crisis, can reduce the impact of the pandemic against them, but it would also uh, be a, a more sustainable approach towards health in the long run. And we appreciate the note made by the Secretary General of the United Nations saying that nobody uh, should be left behind. Madam Chair, in the context of uh, the approach on migration in all its aspects, social, humanitarian, and institutional, I would refer to the Global Pact on Migration adopted in December. 2018. Niger has uh, adopted many policies and we have a participatory and inclusive open document for our policy which aims at facilitating migration and the orderly transit of humans. With respect to our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, my government has uh, set up, uh, as soon as the first case emerged, 
a wide uh, range of measures throughout the country uh, and that covers everybody without any sort of distinction and it was put in place quickly. We've also taken measures on border crossings uh, this year as well as many other measures that approach the challenge of the vulnerable position in which migrants uh, find themselves, especially in situations of crisis. Last but not least, my delegation considers that the international community needs to address the challenge of migration, especially in the context of COVID-19, and do this as effectively and sustainably as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for your statement. Libya, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I convey to you and to this team gathering the warm regards of His Excellency Mr. Mohammed al Tahir Hamoud Asiala, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the State of Libya, who could not be here today, and ask that I deliver his speech to you. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I wish to thank the organizers of this forum and I would like to express in this regard my appreciation to the International Organization for Migration for its contributions in helping to better manage the ever-growing demands of migration. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all aware today irregular migration holds a prominent importance and priority as it touches the core of humanity and human rights of millions of people and affects most countries and international organizations. It certainly poses great challenges for us in Libya, particularly during this difficult time when the negative effects of unplanned and unorganized people movement across borders become exacerbated. Regrettably, this is now topped by the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic and all the health and economic consequences and repercussions that have directly impacted the well-being and lives of our citizens our economy, and the, and the immigrants who are equally affected as other vulnerable segments of the population. Thus, we must consolidate our efforts, our policies, and our actions to come together in a solidarity to mitigate the effects of irregular migration. My country took an early interest in the issue of migration through many initiatives to organize conferences and forums at regional and international levels, including the Migration and Development of Africa and the European Union conference that was held in Tripoli in 2006, and the Tripoli conference in 2010 on African-European cooperation, in which the two sides urged the necessity of intensifying efforts to develop effective solutions to this growing phenomena of migration and the problems that come along with it in the area of security, stability, combating poverty, cross-border criminal enterprise, illicit trafficking, and terrorism. I take this opportunity to reiterate my country's call for the international community to solidify the efforts and shore up its support and assistance to help us better control our southern borders. This will greatly assist in the curbing of illegal, illegal immigration and help alleviate the suffering of people who have become an easy prey in their long journey once they leave home. My country has made unremitting efforts to work with our brotherly neighboring countries, Niger, Chad, and Sudan, to form a joint action framework. We have signed the Niger Agreement for Border Management and Security in June 2018, and we urge the international community to support our efforts in implementing this agreement through capacity building, training, and securing the necessary mechanisms and equipment to activate joint desert patrols along the common borders. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to reduce and better manage the flow of movement of people in what we commonly refer to as migration, we must work together regionally and internationally and address the real issues at the core. We should not look at irregular migration only from the angle of security alone. 
we must address the socioeconomic reasons that make anyone be willing to endure a torturous journey that is filled with dangers and the possibility of even losing their life. Only a comprehensive approach that encourages and invests in socioeconomic development and community investment in source countries with parallel public campaigns and raising awareness about the ills and dangers of irregular migration will bring positive outcomes to all. Libya is committed to working with all and to hold true to the path that we have taken to help alleviate the suffering of all that is in synonymous with illegal migration. We will cooperate with our neighbors and friends in the South and in the North. Libya's stability is key to lessening the suffering of innocent civilians. It also is key to regional stability and that of the Mediterranean. We are hopeful that our stability efforts will be supported by all member states of the international community, and that the days of intervention in the internal affairs of Libya through a proxy war are over. The stability of the entire region is at stake. In closing, I wish to call on all stakeholders to come together and consolidate the various efforts and initiatives that have been launched to address migration such as the UN Global Compact on Migration and Refugees and others, into a unified action plan that will have a far more positive and long-lasting outcome and that is aligned with the 2030 SDGs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, too, uh, for this um, statement. Uh, allow me to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Ecuador. Thank you, moderator. I would like to thank the IOM for holding this important dialogue, the 2020 version, and to the panelists for their important presentations. Ecuador, with a movement of solidarity, always respects the rights of all migrants, and we have been efficient during the pandemic, providing access to public health to all people, whatever their nationality or migrant status. The efforts of the country during the emergency have been ensuring that we have taken care of Ecuadorians abroad and also taking care of refugees and migrants with measures such as providing a process of repatriation of Ecuadorians abroad, which left more than 16,000 to come home and more than 19,000 come from vulnerable groups. Since March 2020, we have um, extended the deadlines for all processes related to migration, including visas that have been extended until the state of emergency is lifted to ensure that people do not lose their status. The process of regularization, which is the largest in the country, has been carried out for Venezuelan citizens and it was not suspended during the pandemic and we have extended the deadline so that Venezuelan citizens can request humanitarian visas. So. We have been able to regularize a large manda, and they're part of the 195,000 Venezuelans in a regulated situation in Ecuador. Nevertheless, the resources to meet the protection and integration needs of migrants are, were already significant before the COVID-19 crisis and now are ever more so because of the social and economic effects of the pandemic. And we need greater cooperation and international solidarity to cope with this. Moderator, no country can manage migration alone, and we cannot also fight off the effects of the pandemic alone. So the Global Pact is essential to ensure that we ensure good security for migrants, particularly as countries are changing policies and regulations on migration in a rapid and unpredictable way. This health, global health emergency requires greater coordination on the most suitable ways to manage borders. And it has been clear during the pandemic that we need to maintain regular migration routes open and we also have to fight trafficking of persons. To conclude, it's fundamental to include migrants and refugees in all response and recovery plans to mitigate the consequences of COVID-19. The inclusive approaches 
guarantee the human rights of all, but also ensure that we can respond better and reduce the risks that uh, will affect uh, sustainable development. Thank you. Uh, you, have, uh, you have now the uh, distinguished representative of uh, Guatemala. Señora representante. Representative of the Director General, on behalf of the government of uh, Dr. Alejandro Giamate, the uh, subject of migration is essential and important, and that's why we want to guarantee the life and safety of migrants and their families. It has always been part of our country's dynamics, and it is one of the priority areas for our foreign policy. Migration is an important factor for development, both for the countries of origin and for countries of destination. Remittances are important and growing for our, uh, source of uh, funds for developing countries, and it represents more than double of the official aid that developing countries receive. And the major challenge is to ensure that there is an effective reinvestment of these remittances. So we need to work on strategic alliances with banks and the private sector. We have been working in with the IOM, UNHCR, UNICEF and USAID, and we have been able to show a different approach to the new challenges of COVID-19 with immediate inter intervention. In coordination with the Ministry for Public Health, uh, we've returned healthy more than 16,000 Guatemalans with the necessary health protocols with an initial health check, uh, professional health observation in hostels uh, for up to 10 days with the provision of food, clothing, access to drinking water and a safe return to their communities. We've also returned safely around 5,000 Guatemalans who were for various reasons, stranded in other parts of the world through whether it be for tourism, work or studies. And through our consular offices, we have followed up on more than 1,000 cases of Guatemalans who were positive for COVID-19. Sadly, 234 died, 228 of them in the United States. Therefore, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs activated in May an emergency fund to face up to the COVID-19 situation, and we've been able to repatriate the ashes of 51 deceased to support their families with low resources. And as part of the plan for economic recovery in the face of the pandemic, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, through its diplomatic and consular missions, has identified significant work opportunities for Guatemalans abroad with the Ministry for Labor, and in that way we can help countries who require labor in areas such as uh, construction, agriculture, and tourism. And we have also, during the pandemic, uh, sent out 61 flights of more than 8,000 Guatemalans through these work programs, particularly to Canada. We also need to ensure that we protect mi migrants because their contribution to the economic growth of all countries is important important. We must work together so that we have a coherent international response and we find effective responses to the rapid economic reactivation of our country so that we can achieve the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much, Representative of the Director General. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, allow me to give the floor to the Ambassador of Philippines. You have the floor, sir. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Moderator. At the outset, I would like to express our appreciation to uh, our beloved DG and the IOM and all supporters for organizing this very important session. We are all aware of what the current pandemic has been in terms of the new sufferings imposed on migrants, and we think that continued international cooperation and dialogue is required to alleviate their plight. In this regard, for the Philippines, the key to ensuring that migration contributes to development and protects the human rights of migrants is the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Wherever your government may be on the GCM, 
we believe that its objectives are aligned with sound principles of human rights and sustainable development. We already know this because they are the outcomes of our thematic discussions in the IDM. DG, we had a briefing earlier this week for my region, led by Mr. Johnson Prentice, on the UN Migration Network, general updates on the Migration MPTF, and the Champions Initiative. These were very instructive, so I wish just to take this opportunity to commend the DG's team in this regard. As part of the steering group of the Migration MPTF and one of the countries that has accepted the invitation to be a GCM champ champion, I can say that the DG's team is working very hard to have these thematic discussions on importance of gender equity and human rights in the context of migration converted into measurable targets. The Philippines will be participating as a panelist on panel two at this IDM, at which time we will provide the details of what we have been doing in terms of government policy. Uh, at this stage, let me just say that the Philippine government has worked to repatriate more than 200,000 of our workers overseas. In this regard, let me just make a few points with respect to the earlier speakers. We are very appreciative of their efforts to share their experiences, and we agree with them on many points. On the uh, receiving countries, we are note full of the aggressive forward assistance stance taken by countries such as Portugal, and we are mindful of what the EU representative mentioned in terms of legal pathways. For sending countries, we share the concerns regarding uh, the importance of recognizing the full and comprehensive nature of migration and not be simply limited to security, and also the call for change based on human rights as we move forward. In closing, let me say that we remain concerned with the effects of the pandemic. The stigmatization of migrant workers continues and negative narratives have not stopped. We should, in conclusion, consider what the shortfalls and difficulties have been, and we should consider how we, as members of the international community, can work together using the IDM and all other international platforms to strengthen our cooperation for the sake of the migrants, their families, sending, transit, and recipient countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Ambassador. Um, I have uh, now uh, Chile uh, on my list. Please, you have the floor, sir. Muchas gracias, señora moderadora. Thank you very much, moderator. We'd like to thank the IOM for calling this meeting of the IDM. And we are facing a situation that has affected mobility of people. And so it's important that we can share experiences and good practice. In Chile, up to December 2019, we had a migrant population of 1.49 million people, 7.8 of the national total. When the pandemic arrived in March, we set up public policy to protect the population and avoid the propagation of COVID-19. And so migrants, independently of their migratory status, were offered equal access to basic services as well as to health care and other assistance provided to the population, such as food and financial assistance. Chile also never closed the borders to uh, foreigners living abroad and they were still allowed to come in just as our citizens. We have also, once the borders were closed, started to assist periodically millions of migrants who were stranded at borders, helping them with in schools and other public places. We have given them all the health care assistance to treat them if they were positive for COVID. And this has been in close collaboration with local government, civil society, and the support of the IOM. We'd also like to mention the measures that are the, put in place to support Chileans who were for, uh, stranded abroad. More than 60,000 Chilean, Chileans were repatriated through uh, consular assistance and with collaboration and financial support from the private sector. In many cases, these 
humanitarian flights left Chile with migrants who wanted to return to their own countries. So we're interested to see how the role of migration can be considered an element which helps to overcome and help with overcome the damage and help with the recovery. And there is no doubt that there will be further pressure on the migratory flows in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished representative of Chile. I have now on my list the representative of Tunisia. You have the floor, sir. Merci, Madame. Thank you, moderator. I would like to congratulate the IOM on the wonderful organization of this uh, session of the IDM. I would like to thank the eminent panelists at this first panel on the important subject and I share fully in their views that were expressed and the crisis linked to COVID-19 presents major challenges for people throughout the world. And the sharing of experience on this is extremely enriching. The restrictions on human mobility expose that many people who are displaced have major risks because of the impact on their rights and their well-being. And they can also damage the collective response to the pandemic and our capacities to recover and we must ensure that no one is left behind. Tunisia uh, thinks that the situation of COVID-19 faces the international community with unprecedented challenges and we will have uh, harmful effects on social and economic matters due to the measures taken to prevent the pandemic and those who are most uh, vulnerable to the pandemic are often exposed. So I would like to congratulate the IOM for having intensified its response plans to protect human mobility and also in their call for funds. We consider that the fight against coronavirus can only be won if all countries include migrants in their response plans, in particular marginalized and vulnerable migrants. This situation provides us with an opportunity to consider how migration can be managed in a more efficient and human manner during and after this crisis. We think that human mobility can be part of the recovery because migrants have an important role to play in host countries and can contribute to mitigating the impact of the virus. So we need to consider them in all responses to the pandemic. The health crisis provides the international community with a way in which to work with human mobility for the good of all and to use the skills and positive contributions to society of migrants. We consider that human mo mobility is essential for development and also to face up to the pandemic and we need to be showing solidarity and coordination in our response because everyone throughout the world is affected. Thank you. Merci, le I'd like to thank the representative of Tunisia for his declaration and I now have four more requests for the floor and the list is now closed for speakers. I'm going to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Afghanistan. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, distinguished colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin at outset to congratulate the International Organization for Migration for their works on the ground through research and also for facilitating safe and orderly migration at this crucial time. Convening of this global collaborative 
and solution-oriented dialogue is yet another example of this important engagement. And it's indeed a landmark achievement that we are already making the 20th edition of this forum. The COVID-19 pandemic brought extreme challenges upon developing economies like my country, Afghanistan. Livelihoods are wrecked, dire economic conditions are exacerbated, public services are overextended, and vulnerabilities of the poor and disadvantaged communities, including migrants, come once again at the fore. We must fully apprehend that under the constraints of COVID-19, reverse progress in the fight against poverty and for economic growth is indeed a looming risk that we have to take on decisively and in a multi-sectoral manner. This must necessarily include adoption and innovation in the field of migra migration governance. It's crucial, for example, that we reinforce our sincere commitment to the central promise of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development for leaving no one behind, bearing especially migrants in vulnerable situations and the related protection challenges in mind. Currently, many Afghan migrants experience either food insecurity due to the loss of income and soaring prices for essential commodities, or on the other hand, the de facto exclusion from preventive health measures that health services resulting from the inability for the opportunities not received. This particularly puts at risk the urban migrant poor, those with uncertain employment and settlement, those with pre-existing health conditions and special needs, child as well as elderly migrants of those journeying undocumented. In some cases, this situation is aggravated by unwarranted anti-migrant stigma, dangerous narratives, and crumbling social cohesion within the host communities. To ensure the full enjoyment of migrants' rights, it's essential to implement an effective public health response as well as enabling migrants to live up to their true potentials as agents of recovery and development, as alluded by some of the distinguished panelists today. It is thus important that the international community extend structured and inclusive access to assistance and services to all migrants, translating this standard into operational reality. The Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, in line with its commitment toward the GCM, while being determined to put its whole strength into addressing these challenges, grateful to its partners, which importantly added to suiting the situation on the ground through their flexible, rapid, and generous support. We must dedicate ourselves to transforming and reinvigorate the spontaneous mixed migration movement during the pandemic well into a managed and a safe migration that can be an instrument, instrumental to the COVID-19 recovery as well as the attainment of the SDGs. It's already forecasted that the pandemic will produce a major downturn in the remittances with dire consequences for those pending, depending on this revenue stream and especially for their potential expenses toward nutrition, health and education. It is crucial that we counter this problematic development, that we stabilize mobility regimes and remittances flow, and thereby continue to tap into development potentials of migrants. As such, it has to be our highest priority to further our cooperation on international labor migration programs and to ensure the openness and the, flexibil and the flexibility of the pathways as well as operational safe safety at border crossings. In retaining cross-border markets and the value chains accessible, we do not only guarantee the circulation of essential goods at the appropriate price, but also enhance the active role played by migrants in the socioeconomic recovery and the long-term development. The benefits to be harnessed from this approach can be upgraded even further when we commit ourselves in a truly result-oriented manner to a long overdue issue area of human capital development and decent work conditions for migrants. In retaining migrants, in returning migrants, we have to persist at disavowing from involuntary returns. 
while facilitating the voluntary journey of those stranded. Furthermore, we have to urgently reinforce our existing reintegration efforts to make sure that migrants' return will continue to be sustainable and beneficial for all involved. Finally, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in proactively engaging in all these areas and partnering with development actors and the private sector, we do have the chance to transform the phase of COVID-19 recovery from an aid model to a self-reliant model of economic growth and trade. For the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, this new agenda of migration governance coincides strongly with the developmental vision to put forward by Afghanistan National Peace and Development Framework 2021-2025, which we look forward to presenting the national community, to the international community at a greater depth in the upcoming 2020 Geneva Conference on Afghanistan. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, distinguished representative of Afghanistan. I have now the pleasure to give the floor to the distinguished representative of Algeria. Thank you, moderator. First of all, allow me to congratulate the IOM for organizing this IDM meeting despite the difficulties presented by the situation. It shows the commitment of the organization to contribute to the world effort to fight COVID-19 and its effect and to manage the socioeconomic impact I'd also like to thank the panelists for their contributions to this session. Madam Moderator, like many countries, Algeria, from the apparition of the pandemic, took on uh, urgent uh, measures in order to uh, ensure that we built capacity to help people and to track and trace the pandemic. And we were involved in the setup of a scientific community to follow the illness. And following our tradition of hospitality and international commitments, we included in our national response all migrants in our territory to ensure that they continue to benefit from free access to healthcare, just as uh, Algerian citizens do. We also appreciate the assistance of the IOM through their office in Algeria to ensure that the national awareness raising campaigns were accessible to migrants. I would just like to conclude by joining the voice of my delegation to that of the Director General, who in his opening statement this morning highlighted the need to not forget our long-term goals. Despite today's context, we need to keep following with the programs and strengthen our programs to ensure that we have a careful assistance to migrants through efficient international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, says the moderator. I would now like to give the floor to the representative of the International Organization of Employers. You have the floor. Merci, uh, Madam Chair. Collega, the International Organization of Employers, if there are three words that the linked COVID economic and protection crises have taught us to focus on, absolutely one of them is recovery. The other two words are essential and partnering. Across our 150 employer and business organization members in 140 countries worldwide, we are not only interested in these three words, we are invested in them directly. What is essential? The pandemic is reminding us every day what is essential. At the center, workers are essential. They always have been. We see in many countries new deepening respect for essential workers many of them foreign workers and migrants that bring a range of skills. They fill demographic and labor market gaps worldwide, providing work and skills that are needed but not available for essential work in healthcare, tech work, farm work, 
food processing and meat packing, hospitality, transportation, and construction, among others. These foreign workers are essential in the crisis and essential for recovery, too. The huge amount of earnings that so many sent home to their families and communities of origin as remittances are essential in the crisis and essential for recovery, too. The same as employment is essential, of course, employers are essential, too, public and private sector employers. The sustainability of decent work, employers and businesses is essential for healthy economies and societies. We will not recover without it. Partnering is also essential. In a world of constricting budgets, partnering is one of the most understated forms of capacity building. Partners bring resources, not only talent and competence, but financial and in-kind. What has been striking this year is the amount of shared interest and common ground across states, international organizations, cities, business, and civil society, sometimes quite surprising to work together on responses to the crises. Not every member of every group, but many, and more than enough to move forward concretely. Finally, recovery. Like workers, employers are essential to recovery, even to building back better, as UN Secretary Guterres has urged. Quickly, this is what our members tell us now, not before the COVID and economic crisis, but right in the middle of them. A first need is for predictable and transparent legal frameworks for the mobility of skills. This includes responsible recruitment practices. There is need as well for skills development programs, skills recognition schemes, and skills matching frameworks that respond to labor market realities. And technology should be leveraged to improve migration management. This includes making many of the widespread temporary regularization measures enacted for essential migrant workers during COVID time permanent. And this is not just for response, it's for recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much for this contribution. Now allow me to, uh, to give the floor to, uh, to the representative of the Global Policy Insight, his online contribution. You have the floor, sir. Sorry. Yeah. Some of what my colleagues have actually said, but one important opportunity COVID-19 pandemic has brought forward is the opportunity to have a dialogue on the changing landscape of migration and also to further our discourse. Looking at what the United Nations Secretary General policy brief raised about unemployment and loss of livelihood that is expected to affect the livelihood of the, of, of the people in the informal economy. And according to the International Labor Organization, it relates that about 85 to 88% of informal economy worker in low income and lower middle income countries will lose their job as a result of COVID-19 impact. So expected right? one of the manifestation is the rural, young, low-skilled workers that lose their job and would want to seek the opportunity to move to nearby countries to explore new opportunities and the fortunes. So in this way, I would feel that we need to establish regional migrant development centers. This would be an institution to help 
develop framework that is based on skills acquired by the job market that will empower these set of young people to be able to contribute to sustainable development goals in that particular country. As well, they could also have the chance to have access to water and sanitation facilities across the migration pathways for migrants. So in this wise, since regional governments are ever shouldering the challenges of migrant flows, partnership is strongly important in order for us to be able to ensure a safe migrant, to be able to ensure a bigger planet, a safe, coordinated, and inclusive and mobility. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have ended now the list of the speaker. And allow me to thank all the, uh, those who have taken the floor today, our membership, the IA membership, and then the uh, civil society representative for contributing today and highlighting the importance of the uh, global compact of migration in the response of the COVID-19 uh, and the, uh, the long, the, the immediate, medium and long-term response needed to, to um, address the challenges posed by the COVID and the responses that should be anchored in the inclusion, uh, comprehensiveness, and coherent policies to, to avoid the uh, impact of um, the COVID on migrant workers particularly, and on the economic um, downturn that we are facing now. So uh, I will with that close the, this panel, and we are running out of time. Uh, the Secretariat, if you have an announcement for the second panel, please uh, do so. And thank you all for being here today for the first panel. And thank you for, so much for the panelists, and particularly those who are traveled longer to, to join us today and to contribute to the debate. Thank you very much for and those who are online, and sorry for the IT issues that we experienced today. Thank you very much. <laughs>